I'm Sylvia Foster Frau, national investigative reporter at The Washington Post. Okay, so this is your elementary. Yes. What do you remember about going here? Uh, Well, I was here kindergarten, going all the way into third grade. So this was when I was still new to learning English. Spanish was my first language. Earlier this summer, I took a reporting trip to East Ramapo Central School District, which is about an hour north of New York City. And I met with Kerry Broncano. This is the entrance, but if you want to see the field, it's a bit of a walk. So, but this is where like we would play, <laughs> right here. She's 23, and she attended public schools there at East Ramapo Central School District her entire life. Yeah, so these are classrooms, I think. And then there's the Hempstead oh, sign. School in good standing. Es <laughs> cierto. <laughs> Barely standing. <laughs> She was driving us around her old elementary, middle, and high schools and wanted to show them to us because um, I had recently learned through my reporting something kind of surprising, which is that all of the schools that Carrie grew up going to, and in fact all of the schools in the district, um, had tested positive for lead in their tap water in 2016. Katie, like, how does it make you feel that in your elementary school there were taps above the legal maximum, including one that was over 2,000 parts per billion lead. I think it's, I'm almost scared at how unsurprised I am. You know, our school district has been failing us for years. And I think I've just gotten so used to having bad news after bad news. Um, I do look back and I wonder like, how much farther could I have come if I was given the means to succeed more, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. When Carrie wonders if she could have succeeded more in life, it's because the effects of lead poisoning aren't always obvious. They can show up slowly over time as behavioral, learning, or other health problems. But what Carrie knows is that for many years as a kid, she had been drinking water that may have been contaminated with lead, something that still happens at alarming rates in the United States, even when it's exploded into public view. So, you know, it's been about 10 years since the Flint water crisis, where tens of thousands of residents were exposed to lead in their drinking water in Flint, Michigan. Tonight, the National Guard mobilizing officials going door to door there delivering bottled water after it was revealed the tap water is contaminated with lead and has been for more than a year now after a change. They kept telling us something was safe and it was it was revealed that it wasn't safe. And I learned an interesting fact earlier this year that I became kind of fixated on, which is this idea that basically parents can be doing everything in their power to protect their kids from blood in the water in their homes. And then they are sending their kids off to school every day in schools that could have blood in their water. And the basis of that is the fact that there's no national mandate that schools test their water for lead. And when I learned about East Ramapo and that eight years ago they had discovered lead in the water and then they actually turned off all of the taps, I wanted to go to that place and learn what that experience was like for those people. From the newsroom of The Washington Post, this is Post Reports. I'm Martine Powers. It's Monday, August 26th. Sylvia has spent this year traveling the country, reporting on the many challenges people face in accessing clean water. She's learned how toxins like arsenic and lead can make their way into our taps. And she's talked to people who aren't waiting for a government fix. People like Carrie Broncano, who are taking matters into their own hands. We have to make all this fuss just to get them safe drinking water. So tell me a little bit more about East Ramapo Central School District and about Carrie Broncano's experience there. Yeah, so this public school district is pretty unique. It's about an hour north of New York City, and there's a collection of towns in that area from Spring Valley to Muncie. And 
Um, it serves, that district serves about 9,800 public school students, the great majority of them Black or Latino students. But then about triple that amount are students who attend private religious schools that belong to an ultra-Orthodox Jewish community that also lives in that area. So in this whole area, this part of New York State, you see this very stark divide between the private school community and the public school community that also falls along these racial lines. But um, Carrie, for all of her issues with the school, she also enjoyed it a lot. And one of the things she talked about a lot was the high school marching band, which is sort of like the shining pride of the district. She told my producer, Emma Talkoff, about it. Like, our marching band is so cool. (laughs) I hope you get to see them perform one day, but... um... Our marching band was definitely, has always been like a source of pride in our district. They're just so awesome at what they do. Were you in the marching band? Oh, no. (laughs) I I did not, I do not have the talent to be in marching band. (laughs) And keep up with them? No way. But um, I was, I was a chorus kid. Carrie really appreciated the diversity at her school. There's so many different cultures present in one room and you know and we're all friends we all get along which is just really awesome but there were still a lot of issues and concerns that Carrie and other students had and people kind of described this pattern of neglect in the public school system where it was like oh cracked floor tiles cracked walls (laughs) and you know cracked ceiling tiles I remember a light fixture fell one time while I was in the cafeteria um and you know we would always make jokes talking about how like we need to come to school with a helmet on (laughs) if we want to be safe one of the issues is not having central air in the schools that she attended it would just be like like just horrible horrible like humidity and just hot weather in the second floor um and not every classroom had air conditioning and this kind of just became a bigger problem when we weren't allowed to drink from the water fountains anymore she found out from other students first and then she remembered having to explain to her parents that they had not heard about it or received a notice from the school. Um, and then at some point it was just kind of everywhere that the schools had tested positive for lead in the water. And, and not just her high school when she realized it, but it turned out that her middle and elementary schools also had lead in their water. And she realized that she had been exposed to this for years. And what was her reaction when she pieced that together? I think she was kind of in disbelief and she felt a little betrayed. Because, you know, lead doesn't just show up overnight. That's just the fact of the matter. Um, So when it started, I guess we won't really know. But the point is it was there. Carrie's family comes from Guatemala, and they came to the United States hoping for a better way of life, thinking that this country was this land of promise and opportunity and also safety for them. And so I think they were all kind of shocked to discover that there was what they basically considered poison in the water that she, her siblings, even her cousins were drinking every day at school. Let's talk a little bit more about this idea of poison in the water, because I think People generally know that having lead in your water is a bad thing. But can you explain a little bit more? Like, why is there lead in the water? Where does this lead come from? And and what are the risks of drinking water that has lead in it? Yeah, so lead in the water can come from a few different sources. The most common source is lead service lines, which were banned in the 1980s. Um, but, But there are legacy lead service lines that were put in place before the ban that have stayed and have contributed to lead in the water. But that's actually not as common for schools. Lead service lines are very narrow and small, and so those usually affect households and smaller, maybe very small child care facilities. Hmm. But for schools, it's not usually lead service lines. It's really like fixtures and plumbing in the school that have lead in there and that slowly over time are corroded and the lead kind of flecks off into the water, and that's what's being consumed. When you say fixtures and plumbing, like that, like the water fountains themselves or, or the sinks or? Yeah, that can be true. It can also be like literally things behind the wall, um, mm. things connecting pipes together. 
Mm. And and once that happens, there have been studies that show even low levels of lead in the water over a long period of time can have an effect on a person's health, much less the higher levels that were discovered in Carey's school. And it can have a variety of effects from brain and nervous system damage, behavioral difficulties. It can affect the development of kids, hearing and speech. Hmm. Um, and it's also been attributed at um, in some studies that 20% of ADHD cases are caused by lead exposure. Oh, wow. Um, so it can really have a very wide-ranging effect. Wow. So tell me about the lead that showed up at the schools that Carrie Broncano went to in, in New York State. And what what were the levels of what showed up there? Yeah, so the federal government considers it a problem when you have 15 parts per billion of lead or higher in the water, which is a way that they measure toxins in water. And it's the same as saying 15 micrograms of lead per liter of water. But in the East Rampo School District, some of the samples were as high as over 2,000 parts per billion of lead in their water. Wow. That was one example of a tap at her elementary school, 65 parts per billion, 73. At her middle school, there was one that was over 1,100 parts per billion. Oh, my gosh. In her high school, there were ones over 300 and 400 parts per billion. So we're talking several times above that 15 parts per billion benchmark. That is wild. Wait, so did Carrie ever get tested for lead poisoning? Emma Takoff, my producer and our colleague, actually asked her that. So this it was a conversation. Um, I haven't been tested. And I, re- I one thing I can say is I regret not getting tested. Mm-hmm. But I'm never going to really know how it affected me. You know, I, I'm happy to say that I'm very happy with where I am in life, with my career. But I always wonder, like, how much more could I have accomplished? And, you know, it's just kind of that never really knowing and the fact that I probably won't ever get an answer. That's a little scary. And a little just, you know, causes me to mourn a little bit, you know, that maybe some potential died along the way. So what happened at the school after they found out about the lead? Like, what did they do about it? So they shut off water fountains across the district, and they started bringing in water for the kids. Um, They covered some of the water fountains literally in, like, trash bags or tape. Some of them they didn't cover, but they just placed, like, these large sort of standing jugs of filtered water. And um, you might remember those sort of cone-shaped paper cups that you can find at, like, offices sometimes. (laughs) They set those up for kids to use for drinking. But they would run out, like, halfway through the day. And then once it's out, it's out. Like, they weren't getting refilled. Um, so if essentially, if you didn't have water, you were screwed. That's just really it. Families told me that those jugs would run out of water very quickly and that when that would happen, if their kids were just coming out of gym class or recess, they would be really thirsty and not have access to water. I remember going to the nurse's office to get an ice pack just to, like, try and cool down. A lot of parents talked about spending a ton of money on bottled water um, and trying to, like, load their kids' backpacks down with, like, multiple jugs of water to take throughout the day. So it was almost like the secondary effect of this lead issue was not even just the lead exposure, but then the eight years later of not having fixed water fountains. So this was eight years ago that they found out about this. That's right. And they haven't fixed it. I mean, I can understand, like, okay, we have to close down the water fountains right now, and we're going to bring in some, you know, like, bottled water jugs for the short-term future. But in eight years, they haven't gone in to actually fix or replace the stuff that's causing this lead. Why has it taken so long to get any action on this? Yeah, so I think it depends on who you asked. I spoke to a school board member who just retired this year after 10 years on the school board. His name is Harry Grossman, and he says that it's an issue of funding and that the school district is so strapped for funding that they had to prioritize other programs and keeping teachers in the schools and a host of other issues that they were never able to get to the water fountains and that because they were providing these water jugs, like that 
that was enough. Um, if you talk to some of the parents, though, they say that this is an example of environmental racism. They say that because they're public school, because they're students of color, that they're kind of being given the shorthand and not the attention that they need and deserve to fix the problem. And, you know, studies do show that communities that are low income and non-white disproportionately have lead-filled water. And so it's not an outrageous connection to put those two together like so many other public school families do. So what did school administrators tell you about what their plan is right now? So Anthony DiCarlo, who recently became superintendent of the East Ramapo School District, said he plans to make, quote, the health and well-being of the school community his, quote, first priority. He said 18 lead-free water fountains and water bottle filling stations are now being installed for the coming school year. And he put in a statement that the district is spending $1.2 million in federal funds for the drinking water issue there, and that they had also received a donation of 20 additional lead-free water fountains. But after so many years of not getting the fountains fixed, a lot of the public school families that I spoke to said they were skeptical that this will actually happen on time for the new school year, which does start pretty soon. Like, how really, truly, undeniably ridiculous is it that Poison was discovered in the schools, and it's taken them seven-plus years to still try and find a solution to it. That problem should have been stopped while I was there. But no, it's still persisting. There's a lot of grassroots organizing going on between the public school families, parents, and former students like Carrie who are really trying to get the lead problem addressed. She and a group of other community members have been attending school board meetings, hosting protests. Um, Not too long ago, they did an informal ballot counting to pass a budget. The school district has been struggling to pass a budget for years now that would raise taxes and possibly give them more funding. So she has been kind of boots on the ground trying to organize as much as possible to get this fixed. After the break, how the parents of East Ramapo are working to get clean water back in their schools, and what you can do to keep children safe from lead. So, Sylvia, you were just telling me about Carrie Broncano, who went to a public school in New York State that discovered a a problem with lead in its drinking water. And this was years ago, and they still haven't fixed it. But I wanted to zoom out for a second and understand why this is happening more largely. What is it about regulations in the U.S. that allow for lead pipes like this to still exist in public schools? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, there is no national mandate to test the water in schools for lead. And there's also no national requirement that if lead is found, that it needs to be remediated in schools. And when I spoke to the EPA about this, they basically pointed out that their role as a government agency is to regulate utilities and not schools. And so they can control if utilities find contaminants in their water, but that they can't control what schools choose to do. Because the utility, it sounds like the utilities are basically like, look, we sent you clean water, and the fact that it didn't end up clean by the time it got to you is not our problem. Exactly. And you can imagine, too, with households, right, private households, like, is that on the homeowner then? Mm -hmm. But with schools, it's different, right? These are public schools, so they are regulated by somebody. And what I found in my reporting is that the USDA actually has a law in the books that requires potable water be served in schools that receive federal funding. But when I asked them more about this potable water definition, they pointed back to the EPA and said kind of basically that the definition of what is this potable water and whether it has to be lead free is in the EPA's hands. So you start kind of going in circles in your reporting trying to figure out exactly Mm. what would be the best solution and, and which agency is the best agency to do that. 
Hmm. How many schools is this happening to? Like, how common is it for lead to turn up in the water at public schools? Yeah, that's a great question. And the simple answer is that we don't know because so many places don't even test. And there's, uh, unfortunately, what was described to me as in many cases a disincentive for schools to test. Because when you do test, and it's shown that there is often lead in the water, there's often blowback from the community and from parents and the school saying, hey, you've been letting my kid drink lead-filled water for years. But there was an analysis done by the Natural Resources Defense Council in New York soon after they had, you know, New York was the first state that had a statewide mandate that public schools test their drinking water. And 83 percent of those schools had at least one tap with over that 15 parts per billion benchmark of lead or more. So that just shows you, right, as an example of how pervasive lead is when it is tested in schools. Hmm. That's, yeah, over 80 percent is a lot of schools that uh, are potentially facing this problem. Mm -hmm. So what are the efforts to try to get some kind of solution to this nationally or get better regulations in place that would force more schools to grapple meaningfully with this problem? So the EPA is expected to release a new rule in October that um, includes a host of changes to drinking water across the country. Um, And specifically for schools, the EPA is requiring utilities to test all the elementary and child care facilities they serve within the first five years that the rule is enacted. There's a few catches to this. You notice middle and high schools are not included. They're not required to be tested, but the the utility has to offer to test them. Why aren't they included? The idea is that elementary and child care facilities are the most have the most vulnerable students. They're the youngest. Mm -hmm. And so they're the Mm -hmm. most ones that are likely to suffer the consequences the most of lead exposure. Interesting. Um, But there are also two catches to this rule. So um, advocates pointed out to me that the testing at the elementary schools is only at five drinking water outlets per building and two outlets per child care facility. So they're not testing all of the drinking water outlets at those facilities. They're doing a select very few Um, And it also doesn't require schools to fix the water if the testing shows that there's elevated lead levels in it. The EPA said that this program isn't designed to be some sort of comprehensive screen for lead in school drinking water, but just supposed to be a preliminary way of, of gauging whether or not it's an issue in the school. And so, as you can imagine, some advocacy groups, um, while glad that the federal government was taking some steps to address the issue, said it does not go far enough with these major caveats in place. So then where does that leave East Ramapo? When I was in East Ramapo, parents were gearing up to protest at another school board meeting to talk about the budget problems they've been having, the disrepair in the schools, and also the lead issue. And they all were gathering before a board meeting to protest the conditions. Saying at Pueblo Unido jamás será vencido, like the, the people will not be defeated. They asked for justice. They took a few laps around the building before they went inside to the school board meeting to have their voices heard during the public comment period. And one of the parents who's always there during the school board meetings and has been unafraid to raise her voice is Terry Rodriguez. We need to be here to fight for your children. We need equal rights in education. It doesn't matter if you're undocumented and don't have papers. You have rights. It doesn't matter if you're coming from another country. You have rights. This is what America was made of. Immigrants, this is how we created America. Nobody should be turned away. Nobody should be denied an education. Nobody should say they need water in school. Que no tiene agua en la escuela. 
She's a Puerto Rican from the Bronx who moved to the area in hope of a more kind of tranquil life and good education for her kids and found herself in the middle of this conflict. Your greatest fear is for your children to want to know if they're going to get sick. As a parent, I look at my children and I worry about that every day. She had her children's blood tested for lead several years ago, and the test revealed that her middle child, who is now 18, had elevated lead levels in her blood. They said it wasn't super serious to worry too much, but it was notably high. A lot of parents are really pissed right now. But some of the times it's like you think in your head and you're like, when the hell is somebody going to wake up and hear And even though Carrie graduated years ago, she worries about her family members who are still students there. One of my other cousins, she just entered high school. She's a freshman. For her entire life, she's been without water fountains in schools, in the public schools. So ideally for me, I want her to have safe drinking water before she graduates. I want her to at least have that, Um, which... Essentially, my dream for her is the bare minimum for others. Sylvia, do you have any advice to people who are listening to this and thinking, wait, like, how can I be sure that there isn't lead in the water at my kid's school? I think the first step would be to figure out what are the rules in your community where you live. Does the state have a lead testing requirement? Does the county, does the school district, does the city? I know that's a lot of layers, but if if one of those is the case, um, parents should be getting public notice of that or posted on the school website. Um, that, that would really be the way to find out if there is testing being done. And then what happens if there is lead in the water? Well, some families will test their kid take one of the blood tests and see if it shows elevated lead. The only concern there is that these blood tests only show recent lead exposure. So if your child has been exposed to lead for years and then in the last two months, for whatever reason, maybe they were on summer break, maybe they weren't drinking the school water, um, that lead in the system would have already dissipated and it actually it it moves into the bones and teeth in your body um, and so it wouldn't necessarily show up at that point on a on a blood test even though it can still be having detrimental effects on your health as we've seen in places across the country school districts and cities have also taken the lead when their state has not to Um, launching testing efforts in schools. And oftentimes, especially at the school district level, that starts with the parents coming together, raising their voices, pointing out their concerns, and really using the power of their voice in these public formats in school board meetings to advocate for those things. And in the end, you know, get those testing efforts in place and seeing what exactly the water in their schools looks like. Sylvia, thank you so much for sharing this story. Thanks so much for having me. Sylvia foster Frau is an investigative reporter at The Post. And last week, there was a new development in this story. The Biden administration announced $26 million in new funding to test for and remove lead from water in schools and childcare facilities. All 50 states, as well as U.S. territories, will be able to apply for that funding. But some advocates say that money is far from what schools need to update water fountains with lead filtering fixtures. Before you go, here are a couple other stories I'd like to share with you today. First, some towns in Massachusetts are urging residents to stay inside at night to avoid a rare but deadly virus spread by mosquitoes. 
The virus, called eastern equine encephalitis, can cause inflammation of the brain, according to the CDC. About 30 percent of people with the virus die. So far, one man in Worcester County, west of Boston, has been infected by the virus. The man is in his 80s, battling the disease in the hospital. State health officials say that this is the first time they've seen a person infected with eastern equine encephalitis since 2020, when there were five cases and a death. There are no vaccines to prevent the virus or even a specific treatment. Massachusetts health officials said that there will be mosquito spraying in counties at risk. Scientists warn that longer mosquito seasons, brought on by climate change, could heighten the risk of outbreaks of diseases. And there's news for astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore as they orbit Earth. The two astronauts arrived at the International Space Station in June, and they were scheduled to stay there for a little over a week. But problems that occurred when the spacecraft was docking have left the astronauts stuck for a long time. On Saturday, NASA announced that they will not bring home the stranded duo from the space station until February. And they'll come home in the SpaceX Dragon capsule, not the Boeing Starliner that brought them there. Here is NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. NASA has decided that Butch and Sonny will return with Crew-9 next February, uh, and that Starliner uh, will return uncrewed. Space flight is risky, even at its safest. Tomorrow on Post Reports, we're going to be diving into this more what went wrong with this mission, and what this means for the future of space travel. That's it for Post Reports. Thanks for listening. Today's show was produced by Emma Talkoff with help from Bishop Sand. It was mixed by Sean Carter and edited by Monica Campbell. Thanks also to Roz Helderman. If you are looking for the latest updates on the big news of the day, check out our morning news briefing, The Seven. We bring you through the seven stories that you need to know about every weekday morning by 7 a.m. You can listen to it wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Martine Powers. We'll be back tomorrow with more stories from The Washington Post. <laughs>